so now we get to sort of the into this into this rule and really what we're doing for the next couple of slides is looking at when and like the exceptions essentially so you cannot disclose that's the that's the the the, the basic overall rule confidentiality and now we're back to the rules of professional conduct rule 3 chapter 3 and there's that you know that blanket confidentiality and then unless and here are the four exceptions now let's get into these exceptions client consent express or implied and that includes with a law firm if the client if the firm you know if the, the the firm is acting for the client it's not just the lawyer if, if, if they're a lawyer at a firm and and that also comes from the definition section in chapter one making sure you know who your client is including an organization and making sure that you know that the the lawyer it's the whole law firm that's caught by confidentiality. So the articling students, the summer students, um, the law clerks, uh, you know, the the um, uh, sec legal secretaries, uh, all the partners, they're all caught by that. If they're a client of the firm, the firm is now caught by that zone of, of confidentiality. Um, required by law or court or tribunal, required by the law society, or there's some permitted disclosure under the rules. So we'll get to some of that. There's circumstances where you cannot, period, at the end of the retainer, client dies, information no longer relevant. Those are not, those don't then, you know, uh, allow the lawyer to waive the privilege. It's, I'm sorry, the confidentiality, it's still there. So, um, and, there, and there's been problems with that in the case law. We've seen some of those cases before uh, where lawyers talk about client stuff, uh, uh, even in the media when they're not supposed to. So what about, you know, so required disclosure? Um, an example of that would be the security of court facilities, uh, rule 5.6-3. If the lawyer through confidential information is aware of something that uh, jeopardizes the security of court facilities, um, that is not a permissive disclosure, that's a required disclosure under the rules. And you can see that in Rule 5.6-3. Um, if anyone has been to the Law Society of, uh, the, uh, sorry, the, the Court of Appeal for Ontario um, and the courthouse down at, at, at on Queen Street um, in, Toronto, in downtown Toronto, there are bullet holes in the wall. Uh, uh, and so the issue of court security, of course, now there's lots of metal detectors and all that stuff. But here's a moment where disclosure is required, not permitted. Uh, is um, if the lawyer has information that's from a confidential circumstance with the, with the client, they're still required to, to disclose it uh, for that reason. Now we get to the harder stuff, the justified or permissive, the permitted disclosure. And here I've just listed the rules that you need to look at. You know, you just need to go through them and have a look. But we're required by law or court order. And so that will depend on the nature of the court order. Um, and what the what the order says, um, three point three dash three future harm exception. So again, here's something that we could spend a ton of time on, but the future harm exception is codified in Rule three point three dash three, and that codification comes from the language of the Supreme Court of Canada's case in Smith v Jones, the Smith and Jones case, and basically, um, there's a test that uh, where there, the future harm exception is where, because of information that the lawyer received from the client, that they are aware of a future harm, they are permitted to disclose with certain, if certain circumstances apply. So it's future harm, not past harm. It's specific harm, it's not generic. It's an identifiable person or group. It's not some random large statement. Um, and it's to, uh, at, a, at a, a specific time uh, and a specific group. So you, and the, and, the, and the language is in the rule and specifically in the case. So there's a test for it and you either satisfy it or you don't. So a generic threat, like for example, if, um, if I were a lawyer and one of my clients were to say something, and I'm, let's imagine I'm in, the, in Washington in early January, and a, and a client says to me, I really hate all politicians, and I really think I'm going to do something 
potentially to some group of politicians someday, I just don't know what or when, that would not be specific enough to be f- for the future harm exception and the Smith and Jones case for the lawyer then to disclose that confidentiality, that confidential information. Um, what you would need is more specifically around a client saying, I hate all politicians. There's going to be on January 6th, an event that I'm going to participate in. I'm going to use weapons and I'm going there with a purpose of doing harm to specific politicians, namely the Speaker of the House and her colleagues at this particular day. Um, and if it's at that moment where the future harm exception starts to play and the lawyer then has the permissive opportunity if in their professional judgment, they think that meets the future harm exception to disclose that to the relevant authorities. It's not a must, it's a may, and that comes from the Supreme Court of Canada. That's the future harm exception. Lawyer self-defense exceptions, uh, 3.3-4, when the lawyer's defending um, uh, against allegations against uh, the lawyer, Uh, 3.3-5, to collect fees if the lawyer has to prove what the lawyer did for the client. Within the zone of, of, of that amount, they're allowed to disclose what they did for the client in order to prove that they did the work, in order to collect the fees in some kind of um, uh, fee hearing, um, like an assessment or what have you. Um, and then 3.3-6, secure, secure legal advice. This is a hard one. If the lawyer needs advice to figure out how to act on behalf of the client or in relation to the client, um, it's possible that the lawyer might be able to breach the confidence by retaining another lawyer and then giving only so much information, sanitized as much as possible to protect the confidence in order to figure out what to do. Um, And so there's a million cases. I can't give you all the sort of the nuances and the exceptions and the boundaries to those rules, but those are the basics around around the permissive disclosure. Others include uh, that are not listed here. There's an innocence at stake, at stake exception, where if the if there's the, the classic example, if the through information given from the client, the lawyer knows that there's someone sitting in jail um, for um, uh, doing something that they didn't commit often what the lawyer's client actually did commit. Um, and the client says to the lawyer, look, I know that person's there. And in fact, I committed the crime. They didn't. Um, and you can't tell anyone because, uh, of my confidence. So, you know, too bad for you. Um, that's the innocence at stake exception. And there, there's a requirement that there's no other way to get the information to the court. Um, it needs to come, that's the only way. And in that circumstance, that's when the innocence, innocence at stakes exception may come into play. But those in the, the, the ones in the rules, and there are others, there's national security, potentially, there's some statutory issues, but those are the basics. Um, and they're set out in these rules here. Um, and so going back again uh, to basics, it's a blanket confidentiality. You don't get to describe it. It's almost absolute, as the court says in Pritchard. And then the very limited exceptions are set out um, here. Uh, there's certain prohibitions when you can't do it. And then there's certain, there's one, the, the mandatory disclosure is here. And then the others that are more permissive that require judgment on the lawyer's behalf, uh, depending on the circumstances. And for those who are interested in learning more about this, as I say, the Smith and Jones uh, the Pritchard case um, uh, and those those Supreme Court of Canada cases that are, have articulated uh, the boundaries of these things are are helpful to understand it further. And then we we look again back at Rule three point two dash eight, which I did mention earlier. There's no whistle, no corporate whistleblowing. Just because the corporation is engaged in securities, you know, manipulation or you know, environmental disasters or whatever, uh, unlike other regular citizens, you don't have free range to go to the police or the newspapers or whatever, unless you can find yourself in these exceptions. Uh, General corporate whistleblowing is not part of the deal. And that certainly came up at the time of of, uh, when the the government was really trying to push lawyers to become whistleblowers. And the Canadian Bar Association 
successfully resisted. And so uh, confidentiality uh, trumps essentially everything, but for these limited circumstances.